Good evening and welcome to Gravitas. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Let's get started. You must have heard about the Cultural Revolution in China, a brutal crackdown by Mao Zedong that lasted a decade. By the end of it, up to 20 million people are said to have died. Now a new president is in power in China, already being compared to Mao, on course to perhaps overshadow him. Xi Jinping has unleashed a new cultural revolution. He's going after schools in a bid to control the future of China, its children. Tonight, we'll tell you about five big moves that Xi Jinping has made to control the education system and eliminate all possible scope of resistance and free thought. From taking over private schools and online tutors to banning foreign textbooks and languages and twisting history to suit Beijing's narrative, Xi Jinping is looking to completely control more than 200 million students of China. On Gravitas tonight, we'll tell you what he's doing and why. Also on the show this Thursday, Afghanistan has lost 10 provincial capitals to the Taliban. We bring you eight videos that show the complete picture of the country witnessing war and talking peace. Guess who is speaking up for the Taliban? The Prime Minister of Pakistan. Why is he playing the spokesperson for a terrorist group? We'll discuss. In Indonesia, officials assaulted a Nigerian diplomat. The video has gone viral. Abuja is angry. It has sought an explanation from Jakarta. And in South Korea... There's a backlash against feminism. Even an Olympic gold medalist has not been spared. We'll bring you a special report. We begin, as always, with Gravitas Global Headlines. China says the U.S. should stop meddling in Beijing's internal affairs on the pretext of the Tibetan issue. A day after the U.S. ambassador to India, Atul Keshap, met a representative of the Dalai Lama in New Delhi. The U.S. envoy said that America supports the religious freedom of the Tibetan people. The Indian city of Bengaluru put on alert after more than 300 children below the age of 19 years tested positive for COVID-19 amid fears of a third wave. India is yet to approve a vaccine against COVID-19 for children. The World Health Organization says around 150 contacts of the person who died from the Marburg virus in Guinea had been identified. The Marburg virus is a deadly cousin of Ebola, which causes hemorrhagic fever with average fatality rate of 50%. The Indian Space Research Organization suffers the loss of an important Earth observation satellite during launch when the rocket carrying it malfunctioned five minutes from the liftoff. This setback comes after several ISRO missions remained delayed due to the pandemic. Morocco hosts Israel's foreign minister Yair Lapid in what is the first visit by Israel's top diplomat to the North African Kingdom since 2003, after the two agreed to normalize ties last year work towards a two-state solution in its conflict with Palestine, country, allegedly in retaliation for deleting President Mohamed Buhari's Hot winds sweep through southern Italy after Sicily witnessed a record high temperature of 48.8 degrees Celsius. Scientists believe this could be the highest temperature in European history. Eight people feared dead after a helicopter with 16 on board crashed into a lake in Russia's Far East. Most of the passengers were tourists and some escaped through the luggage doors at the rear of the helicopter. 
Champions League winners Chelsea have won the UEFA Super Cup after a 6-5 penalty shootout triumph over Spanish side Viva Real in Belfast. Hakim Zayek's first half opener was cancelled out by Gerard Moreno in an entertaining contest which finished 1-1 after extra time. Substitute Chelsea keeper Kepa Ariza Balaga stole the show in the shootout by saving two penalties as Thomas Tuchel's side picked up their second trophy in two and a half months. Six-time World Player of the Year Lionel Messi is officially part of the cryptocurrency boom. His new club Paris Saint-Germain have confirmed that a part of the Argentine signing on fee includes fan tokens worth a reported 30 million euros. A number of European clubs have floated fan tokens recently, which give holders voting rights on minor club decisions and can be traded on exchanges, just like other cryptocurrencies. The summer of 1966 changed China forever. Chairman Mao Zedong was making his grand political comeback and Chairman Xi Jinping was a frail 13-year-old boy. That summer played out differently for both men. Mao Zedong was out swimming. He flung himself into the Yangtze River, put on a show for the cameras and the state media did the rest. One outlet wrote, the water seemed to be smiling that day. It was propaganda at its finest. The beginning of Mao's cultural revolution. But for Xi Jinping, it was the start of something horrible. His father, who used to be a close aide of Mao, was captured and beaten. His home was raided by frenzied communists. His sister died in the chaos of the cultural revolution. This was in 1966. 55 years have passed. Xi Jinping is not a helpless boy anymore. He's the president of China. And what does he do with all that power? Same thing that Mao did. Lead a communist cleansing, unleash cultural revolution 2.0. Make no mistake, it's already happening. Xi Jinping may not be swimming in the Yangtze, but the purge is very much on. He wants to control the government, the military, the society and the schools. He believes the party should lead all of them. And he has more or less achieved the first three, government, military and society. So now he's going after the schools. Tonight we'll tell you about the five big moves that Xi Jinping has made to capture young minds and control their path. Number one, an attack on private education in China. The Chinese state is taking over privately owned schools. No questions, no compensation, just an outright hostile takeover. At least in the last three months, 13 private schools have been taken over. What's the plan here? China has 190,000 private schools. They educate 20% of all Chinese students. Beijing does not like this, not because they hate private capital, but because private schools don't create communist minions. They promote logic, sometimes free thought. And that's kryptonite for Xi Jinping. By the end of this year, China wants less than 5% of its children in private schools. The rest will be shunned to communist incubators. Move number two. The purge on private tutoring. It was a golden goose for Beijing. The Chinese society is obsessed with academic excellence. It's a fertile market for private tutors, especially the online players. They were minting money. Almost $137 billion a year. Now they've been told to stop charging for their classes. Online education should be non-profit, says Beijing. It's basically game over for this industry. This year they could end up making below $25 billion. Imagine that, from $137 billion to $25. Move number three, scrapping English exam in primary school. They're starting with Shanghai. The city has cancelled English exams for elementary schools. They now have mathematics and Chinese language test. What's the justification here? Authorities are talking about reducing academic burden. But it's less about education and more about culture. English is a Western language. China sees it as a tool of capitalism. It has no place in Chinese schools. It doesn't matter if it makes Chinese students less competitive globally. It's all fair in revolution, apparently. And the question of choice, of course, is not even relevant in China. So no English is the diktat. Move number four, a ban on foreign textbooks. You could say this is an extension of the English test ban. They've started with Beijing. The city has banned foreign textbooks in primary and junior high schools. So what will children learn from? 
Books written, vetted, and approved by the Communist Party. Might as well teach from Mao's Little Red Book. The decision challenges logic. Subjects like physics and biology, you see, don't have ideology. So what's the point in banning foreign textbooks? Don't be surprised if these homegrown books are an ode to Xi Jinping about his childhood, his legacy, his leadership. Well, knowledge can wait. Move number five. Filter history, misrepresent facts. This is happening in Hong Kong. A history textbook for sixth graders is being revised. It talks about the Chinese Civil War of 1946. What does the new book say? The Republic of China government led by Chiang Kai-shek moved to Taiwan. This is what the old book said. Now Beijing wants to change that to the Kuomintang led by Chiang Kai-shek moved to Taiwan. The idea basically is to tell the students that those who moved to Taiwan were not the Chinese government. And this is just one example. Multiple changes are being proposed. The idea is to alter facts, to make China look better. It's a complete massacre of history. Put together, what do you make of the situation in China and all these moves? The purge is truly underway. There are no red guards raiding houses. Instead, communist officials are raiding history. Xi Jinping's cultural revolution is a lot more sophisticated. But it's equally ruthless and sinister. The question is why now? Mao launched his revolution to stage a comeback, to reclaim his lost powers. In the process, he killed millions of his own people. What's Xi Jinping's excuse? Well, believe it or not, the new helmsman is vulnerable. There is discontent in the party, especially on his leadership style. The Communist Party constitution bans personality cult. But today, she is party, power and country. His fellow leaders don't appreciate that. Plus, they're tired of his combative policies. China's elite are blocked from entering Western nations. They can't get visas, thanks to Xi Jinping. This discontent comes at a crucial time for this country. In 2022, the party will hold its 20th National Congress. If his party men don't back him, what will Xi Jinping do? Who the people, specifically the next generation, control them? This cultural revolution is about expanding Xi's brand of communism, where education is good as long as it is managed by the regime, where students are lauded as long as they hail Xi Jinping. China's new purge will scuttle innovation or whatever they have of it in China. It will kill diversity and free thought. Children will grow up as loyal fanatics, not responsible citizens. But then again, that's the plan. This is the final frontier for Xi Jinping. He controls the army, he controls the press, he controls the Politburo. Now he wants to control the future, the children of China. But just like the original cultural revolution, this one too is doomed for failure. You cannot teach loyalty from books. You cannot create... A revolution in a lab, it doesn't matter if it's from a little red book or a giant red laptop. To Afghanistan now, still descending into chaos. Ten provincial capitals have fallen to the Taliban. They're moving fast and they're broadcasting their wins. Tonight, we're going to decode the Taliban's offensive for you. How are they moving? What are they doing? And we'll do it with the help of videos, eight videos that give you the full picture of the war in Afghanistan. Take a look at this one. Number one, the Taliban breached the central prison in Kandahar this week. For a month now, this city has been under siege. The Taliban have been desperate to capture Kandahar. This is a crucial economic hub. A lot of trade between Afghanistan and Pakistan flows through Kandahar, and the Taliban set all the prisoners free from the city's biggest jail. <laughs> Now look at this one, video number two. This happened yesterday. The terrorists hoisted the Taliban's white flag over the city of Puli Khumri. The capital of the Baglan province, the one that they captured recently. Here is what happened after the Taliban took charge. And this is video number three. They seized the weapons they could find in Baglan. On your screen is a video that came out today. It shows the Taliban t taking over Humvees, heavy weaponry and ammunition.
Today, the Taliban seized Ghazni. It falls between Kabul and Kandahar. This is the 10th provincial capital to fall in recent days. Take a look at video number four now. These are terrorists from the Taliban rolling into Ghazni with American military Humvees they seized from the Afghan forces. Later, they gathered in the middle of the city to announce their victory. The elected officials are giving in. The governor of Ghazni surrendered before the Taliban. He cut a deal with them. He was given a safe exit from the province. The governor was later arrested near Kabul. Back in Ghazni, there were major clashes. The Taliban prevailed. Reports say they managed to occupy all major government offices in the city. With each passing day, the Taliban is taking more and more cities and closing in on the crown jewel, Kabul, the capital of Afghanistan. At this rate, they could reach Kabul within weeks. The government, the civilian government, is on a slippery slope. Can they not push back? Well, they're trying. Today, they made an offer to the Taliban, a power-sharing deal. This is what the latest reports say. What does a power-sharing deal mean? We don't have specifics yet, but a promise to share power essentially means representation in the government, Taliban members in the Afghan government. That is the proposal. What does Kabul want in return? An end to the violence. Are they in a position to strike a deal like this? The government is negotiating from a position of weakness. They're struggling to push back the terrorists. They're losing territory. They're also looting, losing the battle of narratives. The Taliban's propaganda is only making the Afghan government look weak. It's time to show you our fifth video. And this one is disturbing, I must warn you. These pictures were captured in the Farah city, the area that recently fell to the Taliban. These are Taliban terrorists. They're dragging the body of an Afghan soldier. Why would they release a video like this? To make the government look weak. They're making soldiers surrender and broadcasting the clips for the world to see. They're also going after government institutions. This is the Samangan province. Video number six. The Taliban recently seized Aibak, which is the capital of Samangan. To prove that they're in charge, they entered the office of the governor. They raised the Taliban flag there. <laughs> Video number seven, terrorists dancing outside a government office. <laughs> This is number eight. This is from the Nimroz province. Here the Taliban were seen enjoying fruits and biscuits inside a lavish room, celebrating their victory. <laughs> Eight videos, one story. The Taliban are on a rampage. The government has been pushed to the wall. The terrorists are running a sophisticated propaganda war, beating the government both militarily and psychologically. They don't want a peace deal. They don't want a power-sharing deal. They want power grab. And the world seems to have lost the appetite to challenge that. Why do I say this? Because the negotiations for a peace deal are pretty much dead. A key meeting happened today in Doha. India was part of it. Major stakeholders are desperately trying to revive the peace dialogue. Have they found a way to end the violence in Afghanistan? The simple answer is no. So far, nothing has come out of a dialogue or any dialogue in Doha. US and allies still want a peace deal, but they have no solutions to offer. So is the West just flogging a dead horse? To discuss this and more, 
I'm joined by Habiba Sarabi from Doha. I spoke to her earlier today. She's a member of the Afghan peace negotiation team and the former governor of the Bamiyan province in Afghanistan. Habiba Sarabi, welcome to Beyond. The situation in Afghanistan is alarming. Ten provincial capitals have fallen to the Taliban. An American assessment now predicts that the civilian government could fall within 90 days. Do you agree with this assessment? First of all, thank you very much and uh, greeting to all uh, the people that who are listening and, and watching us. Um, unfortunately, this uh, type of assessment uh, mostly putting a very bad effect to the moral of the people and also to the, as well the, the moral of the military. So always this type of assessment make uh, push us in a corner. The Taliban, is, uh, they are a sort of people that just killing the people and slaughtering the people, uh, or uh, they, they can do any type of abuse for uh, human rights and, and uh, violence that they know in the world, you know that they are even slaughtering the, the children. So who can do that, for example, uh, uh, last year, they uh, they attacked to a hospital. Even newborn baby have been uh, uh, killed on that hospital. The uh, the woman, a pregnant woman, were killed to the hospital. So this kind of horror, of course, will uh, will uh, people will suffer or, or people will will be demoralized. You're a member of the team that has been discussing the peace deal with the Taliban, but the Taliban doesn't want peace, it seems. It's pretty evident now. It is taking territories by force. Why are you still in Doha then? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, the Taliban uh, uh, doesn't want peace. They, uh, they doesn't uh, uh, show uh, willingness to the peace process and to the negotiation table because uh, they believe that by force, by violence, by uh, attack to the cities, they can uh, get more uh, chance to, uh, to get the power. So why we are here? Because this is our commitment. Uh, the commitment of the uh, Afghanistan, uh, the Afghanistan Repo Republic of uh, Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, and the commitment of the people that we want peace. We want to show or uh, show our commitment to the world that we want peace. So it, this decision should be a kind of joint decision with the host country and the the one that they uh, uh, they promised that to bring Taliban to the negotiation table. So U.S. with this. Uh, uh, a very dirty uh, agreement with Taliban, uh, they promised that they will bring Taliban to the negotiation table. Now they have to uh, come uh, to implement that, uh, that promise. And also the host country is here. They are trying very best. They are trying all their effort to, uh, to do something. So it should be a kind of giant uh, decision, not only the government or the negotiation team. Representatives from leading countries are meeting in Doha to revive this peace dialogue, but they have not gone beyond words and some statements that they keep coming up with. Uh, what kind of tangible commitments would you like to see, especially from countries like the U.S. and their allies? Uh, that's true. I totally agree that <clears throat> uh, w only words and uh, declaration cannot resolve the problem of Afghanistan. There should be a serious uh, um, action for that. They have to take serious action on that, especially the U.S. government, the NATO, and, and the, all the country, the regional country. And for example, the the withdrawal of the uh, troops, uh, U.S. troops and NATO troops, it was a decision by uh, U.N. Security Council put on the agenda, and after that got agreement from the U.N. Security Council responsible, uh, the uh, withdra uh, withdrawal should be responsible. After the political settlement, it... Mr. Ravi, thanks very much for joining us here on Beyond. Before we delve into our next story, I was from last month when the Taliban's offensive was gaining strength a lot. This is when Imran Khan Niazi, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, said that his government had nothing to do with the Taliban. or not.
not doing is has nothing to do with us. You know, you have to uh, speak to Taliban about what they're doing. We are not responsible. Uh, neither are we some spokespersons for Taliban. You heard that. We're not responsible for their actions. Neither are we their spokespersons. This was said on the 29th of July. It's been barely two weeks and Imran Khan is doing exactly what he denied doing, acting like a spokesperson for the Taliban. We told you how peace talks in Doha have begun and all stakeholders are trying to work on a settlement, a power sharing deal between the Taliban and the Afghan government. The Pakistani Prime Minister, being a stakeholder in this conflict, was asked to comment on the peace talks. Do you know what he said? A political settlement looks difficult because the Taliban won't talk peace with Kabul as long as Ashraf Ghani remains the president. You have to watch this. The political settlement is looking difficult right now. And it's looking difficult right now because the Taliban are refusing and we tried. I, I persuaded, tried to persuade the Taliban. This is months back, three or four months back. The Taliban senior leadership came here and we tried to persuade them to come to some sort of a political settlement. The only thing that would stop uh, Afghanistan from descending into uh, anarchy is a political settlement. Uh, but unfortunately, the Taliban, when they were here, they felt that um, they, would not, they refused to talk to Ashraf Ghani. Their condition is that as long as Ashraf Ghani is there, we are not going to talk to the Afghan government. Does he sound like a spokesperson? A political broker? Why is Imran Khan, the prime minister of a country, speaking on behalf of a terrorist group? Why is he giving voice to the stance of terrorists? These are questions that all stakeholders in Afghanistan must ask. And when they do, they must also look at another statement where Imran Khan directly attacked the Afghan government for what he called their posturing in blaming Pakistan for the debacle. Listen to this statement now. They are now trying everything to somehow get the Americans back into Afghanistan. You know, the whole posturing right now is that the, they're blaming the Americans for this debacle, Pakistan and the Americans. And they are trying to somehow uh, persuade the Americans to actually intervene. There's a reason they call him Taliban Khan. Because for far too long, Imran Khan has acted like an apologist of the Taliban. He has espoused narratives that have given legitimacy to terrorists. This activism dates back to his days as an opposition leader. Look at this headline from January 2009 when two terrorists had been put on trial in London on charges of encouraging guerrilla warfare in Pakistan. Imran Khan appeared as a witness in the court proceedings and you know what he said. Let me quote from what he said. I would do the same as terror suspects. Well now this man is the Prime Minister of Pakistan and not much seemed to have changed. His government is openly supporting the actions of the Taliban. The only difference is that now he's being called out internationally. For almost a week now, a hashtag has been trending on social media. Hashtag sanction Pakistan. You may have come across it. It's the top trend in Afghanistan, the second most trending hashtag in Pakistan, with a lot of support from the international community. Islamabad says that bots are trending this hashtag. Well, we decided to go through the accounts, and here's what we found. The posts are coming from verified citizens, from journalists, from activists, and diplomats internationally from Afghanistan and several other countries. They all want Pakistan to be sanctioned for its support to the Taliban. The question is, will world leaders take note? Will global bodies take action? Will they sanction Pakistan? Well, we already know the answer, but we'll keep asking the questions nonetheless. And now let's talk about the sins of those world powers that are banking on Pakistan to reign in the Taliban. As of today, there are more than 3 billion people around the world who haven't received even a single Wuhan virus shot. No vaccine for them, 3 billion people. The developed world bought up most of the supplies in advance, so we don't have enough vaccines for the whole world. But is the West even using the shots it is hoarding? No, it's wasting them. These countries are throwing millions of shots into the dustbin, vaccines. 
Why? Because they expired. Our next report tells you more about the shameful and even criminal wastage. In the Netherlands, more than 50 Wuhan virus shots were just thrown into a dustbin. Why? Because there was no one to take them. In America's Oregon, officials didn't realize they had more than 40 shots for healthcare workers. These vaccines had to be thrown out too. And this month, Alabama set a new record. More than 50,000 shots were left sitting on the shelves. They expired. These two will be dumped. Rich countries like the United States and the European Union bought up half of the world's Wuhan virus vaccines last year. Now many of these shots are expiring. And the developed world is simply throwing these shots into the dustbin. By the end of July, Israel had 80,000 shots of the Pfizer vaccine that were about to expire. In the same month, Poland threw out 73,000 doses from different manufacturers. Slovakia sent 160,000 shots of the Sputnik vaccine back to Russia. These doses were about to expire. No one knows what happened to them. But one state of America alone could end up beating those numbers. North Carolina has an estimated 800,000 vaccine doses that will expire soon. The reasons for this wastage are many. In some places, authorities are simply struggling to get more people to take the shot. Sometimes the vaccines are not delivered on time. On a few occasions, the vaccines have gone bad due to storage issues too. But the biggest contributor to wastage is the short shelf life of a Wuhan virus vaccine. Most of these shots can be kept on the shelf for just six months. And the developed world has more vaccines that it can consume. The result is this. A shameful wastage of life-saving shots. The West is leading from the frontier. This month, a survey from 10 American states found that around 1 million doses have gone to waste since the US began rolling out the shots. Europe comes next. Last month, Germany decided to destroy thousands of AstraZeneca doses. Poland has disposed almost 73,000 doses. More than 3,000 shots were dumped in the Czech Republic, while in France, around 50,000 vaccine doses expired. As of the beginning of August, more than 3 billion people in the world were still waiting for a shot. After locking up most of the world's supplies, the West is simply hoarding the vaccines and wasting them. This is criminal. As shots expire, the West is making sure the pandemic lives longer. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. A diplomatic face-off is brewing between Nigeria and Indonesia. At the center of this face-off is a video. A video of a Nigerian diplomat being manhandled by Indonesian officials. Why did they do this? Because the diplomat apparently refused to show his ID. What followed was a scuffle where Indonesian officials tried to restrain the Nigerian diplomat. He screamed, I can't breathe. This is what happened next. What we're about to show you could be disturbing to watch. This is a video of a man gasping for breath. As he is forcibly restrained inside a car. This video is now at the center of a fierce diplomatic face-off between Nigeria and Indonesia. Because the man you just saw is no criminal. He is a senior diplomat at the Nigerian embassy in Jakarta. The men restraining him are Indonesia's immigration officers. What exactly happened here? Here's what we know so far. The Nigerian diplomat Abdul Rahman Ibrahim was approached by three immigration officials in Jakarta. They had received a tip about some foreign nationals whose residence permits had expired. So they questioned the diplomat and demanded to see his documents, primarily his identity proof. The diplomat refused to turn over his documents. 
so he was taken into custody and packed in a car. Once inside the car, the diplomat tried to escape by attacking one of the officials. This is when things turned violent. The video of this incident has now gone viral. The government of Nigeria is outraged. It says that the video shows the disdain that other countries have for Nigerians or people from the African continent. The Foreign Ministry of Nigeria has issued a statement saying the mistreatment that our diplomat endured was against the international law and the Vienna Conventions governing diplomatic and consular. Nigeria has also taken some big steps. It has recalled its ambassador to Indonesia and summoned Indonesia's envoy in Abuja to express displeasure. Back in Jakarta, the Indonesian government is trying hard to contain the damage. The Foreign Ministry says the incident is regrettable. But it cannot be generalized to represent Indonesia's behavior towards foreigners on its soil. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs regrets the incident on the 7th of August. I repeat, the incident is an isolated incident and is in no way related to the commitment of the Indonesian government in carrying out its obligations as a host country in accordance with the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. Indonesia says the matter has been amicably settled. But the diplomatic moves being made by Nigeria suggest that it is not entirely resolved. We haven't heard the last of this story. Bureau Report, we on World is One. Feminism is under attack in South Korea. Online trolls and bigots are targeting women for their looks and choices. They say feminism is creating a gender conflict, pitting men and women against each other. It's a bit rich coming from men in South Korea. They've marginalized women, denied them rights for decades, and now talk about gender conflict. Why is misogyny so entrenched in this country? What triggered this backlash against feminism in South Korea? Our next report tells you. South Korea won six gold medals at the Tokyo Olympics. Three of them courtesy this athlete, An Sun, arguably the best female archer in the world. But South Korean men aren't impressed. They want Sun An to return her medals. Why? Because she has short hair and so-called boyish looks. Just one problem, nobody asked for their two cents of misogyny. This has become a problem in South Korea. Unfiltered hatred towards women and feminists. They rubbish gender quotas, bully successful women and want to abolish the gender ministry. I think anti-feminism sentiment has existed for a long time. It is especially active online where women are objectified, with violence against them being mocked as though it's a game or a joke. These online campaigns can be ferocious, and unfortunately they can also be popular. One anti-feminist YouTube channel boasts of 300,000 subscribers. How did misogyny become so rooted in South Korea? The society has always been male-dominated. More jobs for men, more pay for men, and more privilege for men. South Korea has the highest gender wage gap among developed countries. In recent years, there has been a pushback. The last decade saw some of the biggest women's protests in South Korea. The fragile, bigoted ego was hurt. Young keyboard warriors unleashed anti-feminist hatred, and they didn't have to look far for inspiration. South Korean politicians had that covered. I think the biggest problem currently in South Korean politics is that politicians are denying that institutional discrimination against women exists and they are dismissing women who voice concerns about women's rights as a source of gender conflict. 
Meet lawmaker Hai Tai Kyung. He thinks feminism is a fad. He wants to abolish the gender ministry. And by the way, he hopes to be president one day. Conservative politicians are drumming up anti-feminist narratives. It's proving to be a dangerous game. Spy cam and revenge porn crimes are rising. Women are bullied and harassed online. And when they react, politicians call it gender conflict. This is truly an alternate reality. Gender quotas are described as victimizing men. Women activists are dubbed radical and militant. No one is spared. Not even a triple Olympic champion. President Moon Jae-in calls himself a feminist, but under him, things haven't improved. Women continue to wage a lonely battle. No government support, no muscle on the anti-feminists. While most of the world is debating how to achieve gender equality, South Korea still can't decide whether they need equality. Bureau Report, we on. World is one. Today is International Youth Day. It's a day to celebrate the most dynamic people among us. They're restless, they're full of hope. They have the power to change the world, to create change. Today's youth are a complicated lot. For instance, how do you address them? Are they Generation Z, Generation Y, Millennials? There's a lot of letters going around and trust me, you don't want to get them wrong. This is a difficult demographic to classify. So we'll go by the United Nations. They define youth as anyone between 15 and 24 years of age. It seems like a fair definition. International Youth Day is about giving young people a voice to shine the spotlight on their initiatives, to understand their ideas and beliefs. It was first celebrated in 1999. This year, the United Nations has linked up with the Food and Agriculture Organization. The theme is transforming food systems. We need youthful exuberance. We need youthful innovation. That's the only way to solve the challenges of our times. But can we work with our youngsters? Do we even understand them? Not perfectly. The youth are rebellious. They challenge the status quo. They want to break the norms. For decades, we dismissed this as hysteria. We made fun of it. George Bernard Shaw said, youth is wasted on the young. So you get the sentiment. The youth are defined by what they lack, be it emotional maturity, patience, or understanding. But they can also be catalysts for change. Take any mo movement in history, the civil rights movement in the United States, the anti-emergency protests here in India, the climate protests happening around the world, the youth are on the front lines every time. So why do we dismiss them as emotional and radical? Because a lot of times they are. The youth are always in a hurry. They hate waiting around for change. Sometimes this can alienate people. But we have to understand that these emotions, where these emotions are coming from, they live in a world that is changing every day and changing very fast. They grapple with new issues like their sexual identity, their mental health, climate change for that matter. All of this leads to a lot of stress and the stress shapes their hopes and aspirations. Today's youth have a more holistic approach to life, take their attitude on jobs. Deadlines are important, but not more than themselves or their mental health. That is their approach. Same with the whole male breadwinner attitude. Today's youth do not conform to such gender norms. But don't confuse this with some ascetic life. This is 2021. This is a world of consumerism, marketing and leisure. Instagram and YouTube entice them with pictures of a better life, of luxuries and careless living. Some of them are seduced by this lifestyle, but not everyone gets there because aspirations don't often mirror reality. The biggest example is the job crunch. There are simply not enough jobs in the market anywhere in the world and the available ones may not fit young expectations. Society does not help either. And by society, I mean the cyber one mostly. Social media is a constant pressure point. Young people are concerned about Facebook likes, how they look in pictures, how their friends look in pictures. Social media is basically peer pressure on steroids. Navigating this is hard enough, but nothing prepares you for the job market. It's a precarious time to be out job hunting for anyone who's young or old for that matter. The pandemic has created an economic slump. The gig industry has been wiped out. 
What about the future? Well, history tells us there will be an economic boom at the end of this. But more jobs does not mean better jobs. What if the new jobs do not excite the young? That's a big problem. In a survey conducted in 2020, two out of three millennials said they would quit their job that year. You don't know whether they did, but you understand the sentiment, the attitude. The job market is an employer's market. Even if you have the educational chops, there is no guarantee you will get that dream job. In many places, the job market itself is a dream. Take Africa, for instance. It is the youngest continent in the world. Nearly 60% of its population is below 25 years of age. Their problems are completely different. The daily horrors of war, epidemics, gang violence, it's a vicious cycle that keeps them poor. And that's why it is important to have days like today, like this one, to expose the realities of all youngsters, not just the well-off and the privileged. In many ways, that's the essence of this generation. Their age unites them. But their ideologies are different, their causes are different. They're growing up in a complicated time, a complicated society. They're fighting themselves, the system, and occasionally their parents. We often call the World War II generation the greatest generation. They rallied around a single cause, a war. Today's youth have many causes, many missions, and that multitude is what defines them and their urgency. On that note, it's a wrap. We're leaving you with Gravitas Images. Thanks for watching.